Okay, so let me thank the organizers for inviting me here. And uh, I want to speak today about a paper that uh, just came out, which is called Exploring Large-Scale Entanglement in Quantum Simulation. And I think it sort of symbolizes, I think, what uh, uh, theories like myself uh, have been experiencing over the last few years. You know, if you go 25 years back, uh, people like me and also Ignacia and so on thought about uh, how to build quantum computers or simulators and so on. And of course, there have been fantastic experimental developments, you know, that have been documented also in the talk here. But what's sort of, you know, great from the theory side is that very often now when we have some ideas, you know, what to, what to actually work on and come up with maybe new algorithms or new concepts or whatever, we can actually go right away to these uh, quantum machines that the experimentalists uh, built and credit, of course, should go to them. And uh, sort of uh, what I'm going to talk about here is um, some work that we have done together with a group of Rainer Blatt, Christian Rose, where we are allowed to program quantum simulators, but at the end sort of, you know, um, doing things that we believe is really kind of fundamental science. Uh, this has to do here with this exploration of large scale entanglement in quantum simulation. So let me tell you a little bit uh, what this whole thing is about. Uh, well, we had here several talks you know, about uh, quantum simulation per se. You know, we have some maybe material, whatever it is, doing high energy physics. At the end of the day, you write down a Hamiltonian here, and uh, you want to sort of um, you know, solve this many body problem under quote by you know, building a device, either as an analog simulator, as a digital, or maybe in some hybrid quantum simulation instead of classical computation. And the reason why we do that is, of course, that uh, we always argue uh, that uh, you know, entanglement is kind of the secret uh, sauce behind uh, the power of quantum computing. Um, very often, you know, we speak about entanglement, but we never really you know, measure it or somehow quantify it, at least not in detail or at least in the large scale that we are supposed to do, that we actually promise when you talk about quantum computing. And uh, so the question I would like to ask here today is this, what we can, we can learn uh, that we would like to learn sort of uh, entanglement structure of many body wave functions in the limit uh, of uh, very large uh, particle numbers or large systems or some subsystem sizes. And the reason why this is, um, you know, a topic uh, that's sort of different from, you know, entanglement on the quantum computer is the fact that the entangled states that we have here are actually generated by Hamiltonians that are physical Hamiltonians, like this Heisenberg Hamiltonian that I'm writing down over here, you can see that it has actually two-body interaction, nearest neighbor and so on, all of that. And of course, all of that is leaving its uh, fingerprint down here in the entanglement uh, of the states that we generate on our quantum devices. And uh, this is the topic that we would like to explore. I mean, some of you know immediately that, of course, when we go to ground states of such systems, we have area loss, which is the basis, of course, for being able to do classical computations, but if you go to excited states, you don't, or if you do quench dynamics and so on. And uh, we would like to quantify that and really look into this entanglement sort of on a, on a more detailed level than we have been able to do so far. So um, in doing that, you know, we have written over the last few years several papers. You know, we have developed things uh, like this randomized measurement toolbox, as we called it, and uh, John Breskill and friends call it classical shadows coming from a somewhat different direction. Where, for example, you know, you take a quantum simulator and you look at, say, quench dynamics, or you run a VQ circuit or whatever, and then you perform, you know, random rotations of the qubit over here. And, uh, for example, we came up initially, you know, with uh, the possibility of measuring entanglement entropy, sort of to quantify entanglement. But in the meantime, we have actually progressed up to the point where we can quantify this bipartite entanglement by doing a full entanglement Hamiltonian learning and uh, let me explain a little bit what's behind it without entering the details. Suppose that you have a many-body state over here. Uh, this is prepared in the wave function, say ground, excited state, whatever. Uh, then uh, if you define a reduced density operator like over here, tracing out uh, this region B over here and focusing on A, uh, that's a reduced density operator. Of course, we can always rewrite that in terms of what we call, or what the condensed metaphysicists call, um, uh, call an entanglement Hamiltonian. Um, the secret thing about you know, this uh, entanglement uh, Hamiltonian is the fact that very often if you have many body systems, then under certain circumstances, one can argue and expect that these entanglement Hamiltonian have a rather simple structure, a structure that could be learned in measurements 
And uh, this is the game that we are going to play in the following. And there's even some theoretical predictions to you know what these kind of entanglement Hamiltonians would be and what the structure is for ground states and also excited states. And you will see afterwards, these are the kind of things that we would like to see in the experiment. So in this sense, we would like to do an entanglement Hamiltonian learning, learning the operator structure of this entanglement Hamiltonian up there. And you might ask yourself, why not learn sort of a dual tomography of the reduced density matrix right away? The answer is, of course, that in general, a reduced density matrix, learning a density matrix is exponentially expensive. But uh, if the um, entanglement Hamiltonian has a structure that's simple, we can sort of, sort of learn it more efficiently. So it becomes kind of a way of doing an efficient quantum state uh, tomography. Of course, something that we are making an ansatz over here is something that we have to uh, find out what it is, but then also verify the end. So this is not a way of going around the exponential, but it is a way of sort of, you know, we can check if these things apply or not by the end having verification. So this leads to something like sample efficient learning, or is, uh, which scales up to large particle numbers. And I think that the reason why these things are kind of interesting is that Number one, that's a very general statement about quantum simulation per se and the entanglement structure, but it also has the potential of scaling up to the regime of uh, quantum advantage, where we might no longer be able to do classical simulations to test uh, what we see in our quantum simulators. Um, so as I said before, you know, we have the opportunity of using uh, Rainer Platt and Christian Rose's uh, quantum simulator in his book that's uh, a traditional, you know, uh, n equal to 51 uh, ion chain, a programmable quantum simulator that natively has this Hamiltonian over here. That's an icing Hamiltonian with long range interactions. I guess most of you know these things quite well. Uh, what I find exciting is that in the meantime, we also have 2D systems available. In Innsbruck, there's, um, you know, systems with, for example, 200 ions in the 2D dimension. Um, in Jinghua, Luming Duan is talking about 1,000 ions in the cryogenic trap and so on. So the story that I'm telling you, in principle, should also work for these high dimensional cases. And of course, should also work then at the end, you know, for uh, completely other platforms. So um, what I would like to discuss now in the following is that um, in the experiments, so sort of what we expect theoretically in the protocols that we develop, provide this compelling evidence of this local structure, the entanglement Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, for ground states, we have this, what we call the first observation of Bisignano Wichmann structure of the entanglement Hamiltonian. I'll tell you afterwards what this thing is. It makes very specific predictions for what the structure is. And we can see that actually in our programmable quantum devices. And as I said before, you know, on the theory side, there's these tools that I just had mentioned. So instead of designing an experiment, um, you know, from a theoretical point of view, this is like planning how to program a quantum device well. You can see on the left upper side over here, what we have is our ion chain. And we're interested, for example, say in preparing a ground state. I'll talk about this thing now in one minute. Um, and uh, take out a certain subregion row A, and we have here a reduced density operator. And we're interested in finding what the entanglement Hamiltonian is as a complete characterization um, of this uh, bipart entanglement that we have. And if you take now a Hamiltonian, like the one that I'm writing over here, and I write down here Heisenberg Hamiltonian, uh, we would like to find out what the entanglement properties are, like, for example, preparing the ground state, the many body ground state, that's our energy spectrum over here, ground state over here, where we might expect, for example, for Hamiltonians of this type, and generally in quantum simulation, I guess, with these K-local Hamiltonians. And area law dependence, if you go up to excited states and prepare one of them, you would expect something like volume law entanglement. And um, in the particular case that we have here, you know, the Heisenberg model, we've chosen it in such a way that, well, actually, you know, uh, this has a critical point over here where conformal field theory is valid. And then we have a gap phase over here. So we can explore some of these things at all of these different points and ask, you know, this entanglement structure, um, you know, at critical points and so on in accordance that very often we have very fundamental theoretical predictions what these things are supposed to be. Now, I said before that the Hamiltonian that we have here, the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, is not natively realized um, directly. Uh, one might try to do that, actually, but it's not natively realized you know, on, the, on the trap ion simulator. So what we do is this, that we just run some very short uh, circuits, VQE circuits, to prepare ground states as variational quantum ion solver, and also you know, do a similar thing for the excited state. So, we did not try to work very hard on this point over here, but you will see that we actually got pretty good results in doing that. 
that's sort of more the um, you know, tool for being able to look at the entanglement properties here on the right hand side. And as I said before, you know, the real uh, effort sort of the brain of theory goes into uh, developing the protocols that at the end allow us to do this kind of tomography for this entanglement Hamiltonian learning. And it is this sample efficient tomography of the reduced density operator that allows us to learn these entanglement Hamiltonians for subsystem sizes larger than uh, 20 lattice sites. And I think that's quite exciting. So here's a typical example. And as I said, I consider this to be more technology statement and rather something that we work on very hard. You write on the Heisenberg model, you know, you can write on a VQE circuit, um, variational quantum eigensolver circuit as a variational circuit, you know, that exploits the very long range entanglement interactions like the icing interaction I told you before, the native one as a highly um, long range uh, end particle gate. And then you can uh, design you know, certain, um, certain um, uh, quantum circuits over here that you can optimize you know, on classical computers for small particle numbers, typically 12 or so. And then you can try to scale them up running in, um, on the quantum machine. And all of these things are now running on the quantum machine, minimizing here the energy for the target Hamiltonian, which in this case is just the Heisenberg Hamiltonian up here. And typical results are here on the left hand side. You can see that we sort of, you know, under quote, are cooling down to low temperatures. Um, well, I shouldn't call it temperature here because these are really wave functions. These, it turns out that you prepare by a relatively short circuit here something which is within 2%, you know, of the ground state um, energy. Uh, basically, you know, out of this Hilbert space, which is 2 to the power 51, you know, modular some symmetries, of course, that we have here. You know, you uh, get the superposition out, which is um, not the ground state, but the superposition of the maybe 300 uh, lowest lying states uh, of your model over here. So I think that this is pretty close to the ground state. And this, at the end, it leads to the fact that we can basically argue that we see ground state properties or something very close to the ground state when we ask about the entanglement properties of states of ground state of these Heisenberg models that we prepare in this way. Um, as, as I said before, you know, the long range interaction is kind of key to that whole thing. But let me now tell you the story, which is really a physics story that, um, you know, I think is important, not because we talk here about the Heisenberg model, but I guess because most of the conclusions that we have over here, uh, we expect to apply, you know, in a much more general context, you know, other models, um, but also in higher spatial dimension, we are just doing 1D, of course, over here. So suppose that you got a, a many body problem and we have some Hamiltonian in the way that we write it down over here. And I already told you that we're interested in the Heisenberg model, uh, both in this uh, critical point, uh, uh, actually gapless over here and then gap uh, here to, to the right. And uh, suppose that we uh, prepare ground states and we can also prepare uh, excited states. Uh, of course, we never prepare the real ground state and really single excited states, they always somehow know some superposition of some of the low lying or um, uh, excited states up here. Uh, if you prepare that, I mean, what would we expect for the entanglement spectrum uh, for the for the entanglement, you know, uh, in these particular cases? Well, for the ground state, already mentioned before, we expect something like an area law dependence or at the critical point, like a, like a log area law. So this scales like the uh, area and also in 1D system, this should be basically a constant over here. And if you go to excited states, you would expect like the thermal entropy, you know, um, something like a, a volume law scaling. So in the case over here, it should be linear as a function of this uh, of the subsystem size that we have. So ground states, of course, we always say, you know, live in a small corner of the Hilbert space and the excited states, you know, in the, in the rest over here. Uh, but let me start now uh, thinking a little bit about this entanglement structure. Uh, of excited states. And let me simply appeal for simplicity here to this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis um, using this Hamiltonian over here. Suppose that we prepared um, one of these states up here. We don't do that directly in the experiment. We'll obviously be some superposition, but for the moment, think about this here. So this is our, our you know, uh, quantum system over here. We take a certain subregion over here that we pick out you know, from, the, from the center of this ion chain. Uh, we have then the reduced density matrix, and if I ask you, you know, what the, uh, what the corresponding reduced density matrix over here is, then I guess you would immediately kind of uh, say, well, you know, what we teach in statistical mechanics is that if I take an uh, energy up there, we expect that the subsystem should be like a Gibbs state. So like the reduced density matrix, like an E to the I beta being the inverse temperature correspond to the energy. And then we have here the Hamiltonian. That's the Hamiltonian corresponding to the subsystem over here. 
And let's, for simplicity, rewrite this thing in a form as an um, you know, Gibbs ensemble where we have here local temperature, uh, beta i. Well, uh, over here, of course, there's uh, this local temperature simply constant in time, but it will uh, constant in space. But you will see in a moment you know, what the point is of the story when we talk about the ground state. So if I want to visualize you know, uh, this reduced density matrix here, it is simple, uh, simply a Gibbs ensemble. And you know, the temperature that we have over here, as you can see, will always be constant here uh, when I make my subsystem larger. And this immediately applies that, that the entanglement entropy here will scale linearly with the subsystem size. So what will happen if I take this, uh, you know, sort of uh, familiar results that none of us, I guess, will argue much about. If I now cool the system to the ground state, like what we do with our BQE circuit, uh, you know, the, there's a very interesting theorem in uh, uh, relativistic quantum field theory, and that I quote here for the more special case of a conformal field theory. And I mentioned before that if you got the Heisenberg model at the critical point, that's scale invariant. So a conformal field theory is a continuum theory applies. And this is very remarkable theorems uh, that are really theorems in, in conformal field theory, relativistic quantum field theory that the reduced density matrix is basically given by, well, just take the Hamiltonian densities that we have in our quantum field theory. And uh, there is now not a constant temperature in front like a normal Gibbs state, but it is you now an inverse temperature profile in the form of a parabola. Um, and that's there an exact result. In our case, of course, where we work on the lattice, that's not exact, but now you can see what the point is of the story that we expect that the reduced density matrix can be parameterized like a Gibbs state. Um, and if you take now larger and larger system sizes, you can see uh, how these parabolas you know, sort of scale. And this applies immediately that, well, we had the critical point here and log uh, uh, scaling this log area law. And this is how, you know, when you go from the excited state to the ground state, we would expect in these systems uh, that these reduced density matrix evolves. Actually, this is a very simple interpretation. This parabola over here simply means that when you go to the boundary over here, the state is more mixed. And if you go to the center, in this sense, it's kind of colder. So it simply means that we have entanglement across the cut over here. And in the center, well, you have less entanglement from here to over here. This is basically what this result sort of says intuitively. So at that point, you might say, well, let's now go back and then using the tools that we have developed to see all of that here. Again, that's the Heisenberg model. You know, uh, we have here this um, uh, central charge equal one conformal field theory with the critical point and the antiferromagnetic uh, state over here. And you can now make an, an ansatz for the entanglement Hamiltonian where we simply say, well, uh, let's try a, um, a Gibbs state, you know, that has a local temperature, a local inverse temperature, and find out, you know, by fitting to experimental data and doing this kind of tomography over here. Um, at the end, and also verifying, I should add over here, you know, what these uh, sort of inverse temperature profiles are. Well, you can do that first of all theory on the theory side, and you can see these beautiful parameters coming out for a ground state. This is just here my G calculation. And you can see this flat uh, uh, inverse temperature here for the excited state, modular some effects at the boundary. So we don't really produce in the experiment and also in theory here really thermal states per se, but something that's um, a reasonable approximation to the whole thing. Um, it is actually remarkable how well this, uh, you know, Gibbs ensembles work in this case over here. But let me now come back and show you what you obtain when you're trying to see all of that, putting all of our tools together on the actual quantum device, on the simulator, uh, preparing the ground state, you know, in the way that I sort of said before with the Cree circuit, uh, running our measurement protocols that we have over here. And here's the final result. And you can see right away if I go here um, to the left column, no, if I take go to the critical point, indeed, you know, for the ground state, you see these very beautiful parabolas coming out over here, and uh, there's basically agreement between theory and experiment uh, within the the error bars. And if you go to the excited states that you have over here, well, it's not completely flat temperature profile because we don't have a, per a perfect state, but if you go to the uh, to the entanglement uh, entropy, you can see here the area law, and you can see here the volume law very clearly emerging. So I, I guess that you know you should be aware that we are able to do this uh, you know, tomography for subsystem sizes in the 51 ion simulators that exceed 20. So this is something that's definitely far beyond what would normally be done in the context of a quantum state tomography. You can also go away from the critical point where it's not entirely obvious that this procedure works. And I could also discuss that here. This then becomes more 
triangular shape and uh, we see that also in numerics and we see have also arguments why this should be the case. Uh, but um, let me now sort of show you a little bit this uh, scaling, you know, with the subsystem size and, um, you know, when we push these things now to the limit. Again, you can see here the circuit. We have here our protocol down here that allows us to do this whole uh, quantum state tomography in this sample efficient way. And um, you can now see here this parabolas, and this is really learning this um, inverse temperature profile here individually. And uh, if you go to these larger system sizes, because classical computers have difficulty doing all of this fitting over here, we take a simpler form of uh, taking a parabola, you know, that's allowed to be flat with a certain offset and all of that. And the consequence is that, well, we see these parabolas, you know, for very large subsystem sizes. So we have many more results uh, along these lines over here. Um, but um, let me emphasize that, you know, uh, that this is maybe the first time uh, that we see this kind of a Pisoniana Wichmann type predictions for the entanglement structure of ground states versus excited states here. Um, there are some predictions about the transition from ground states to excited states and all of that. And um, I think maybe more important, we expect this to be universally valid or rather universal. Uh, you know, all of these theorems come with a certain fine print and we do it for lattices. So there are certain corrections that we might be able to see at one point. It would be interesting to understand and calculate. Uh, but, um, you know, it is also important, let me emphasize that what we do uh, is that we not only, you know, take here an um, um, hip state here that we fit then at the end, you know, to some experimental data. We also do a verification protocol by you know, inferring what the reduced density matrix is and comparing it with further data, looking at the overlap of reduced density matrices. So we have a verification step built into the whole story, which is very essential because otherwise you never ensure entirely what we do in these fidelities that we get over here, uh, you know, taking different data runs and then comparing that and comparing here with experiments are amazingly high fidelities for, you know, for the ground states, but also the, sort of for these as I called it, heated up states, avoiding the word thermal state over here. So this brings me to my uh, conclusion. Um, I tried to tell you that we as theorists are pretty excited about being able to use these quantum machines that seem to do what we expect them to do. And uh, now seeing new physics uh, like the one here, uh, maybe hopefully at the end and also the regime that's classically no longer accessible with computers, but not like what I've shown you here, we can compare theory and uh, numerics in, in 1D. Um, all of these things I told you about should be valid in higher dimensions. You can immediately apply them also to different models and different platforms. And will be very interesting to see to what extent this local structure of the entanglement Hamiltonian is sort of universally valid also in, in, in other contexts. And um, this, uh, you know, measurement the toolbox that we have to develop, I mean, definitely this will be applicable, you know, uh, across uh, platforms and different models and so on. So what I've not talked about here is uh, several other topics. Actually, I had a hard uh, time choosing, you know, what kind of things we should, uh, I should talk about here. We've done a lot of work on analog and digital quantum simulation for non-abelian lattice gauge theories. We heard um, Misha's talk yesterday that the uh, digital quantum uh, simulation that sort of uh, requires at the end, of course, error correction at one point um, is on the horizon. So many of these algorithms, you know, and particularly also thinking about co-design of quantum hardware and quantum algorithm in the context of these kind of simulations, uh, I think bring us to the point where we might be able to do some really new physics and maybe at the end and also discover with our quantum devices something interesting and new. And uh, finally, a lot of these ideas also translate to optimal and variational quantum sensing where we're using these programmable quantum simulators, uh, running them as sensors that we can also program to sort of measure or to, to define optimal sensing protocols, which is, uh, you know, a story by itself that uh, I don't have time to talk about here anymore. Thank you very much.